Is it bomb for Bedard time? Is Dean Evison on the hot seat? Why is the effort level better on one side of the ice than the other? We answer all of the fan-related questions about the Wilds 0-3 start today on Locked on Wild. You're locked on Wild. Your daily podcast on the Minnesota Wild. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. That's right. It's time for yet another episode of Locked On Wild, your daily Minnesota Wild podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Wild your first listen each and every day. Just as a reminder, Locked On Wild is free and available wherever you listen to your podcasts. On today's episode of Locked On Wild, we respond to listener feedback on the first three games of the season, looking at some of the questions asked and trying to decide what is potentially legitimate and what is not something we need to worry about at this time. My name is Seth Topal, your daily Minnesota Wild insider, and I don't think there's any better way to decompress after uh, yet another Minnesota Wild loss than just asking the listeners what they have seen, what their biggest questions are, biggest fears are uh, for what we've seen for the Wild so far through uh, three games. And so uh, just threw it out there on Twitter and uh, and on YouTube yesterday. Uh, we thank you for those that uh, did respond and uh, threw some things out there. We'll try to answer as many as we can. And don't worry, we'll do this plenty more during the course of the season. I want to start with one. And uh, this was mentioned a couple of uh, different times. And so uh, I'll... Just mention it. Uh, I know in the comments I had responded to uh, to Trav's comment, uh, and uh, I'll also respond to uh, shout out to Tobias Funke, um, one of my favorite Arrested Development characters, by the way. Is Dean Evison on the hot seat? Is his seat starting to get warm based off of what we have seen so far this season? And I will go out on a limb. I'm going to say no. And here's why. So I think one of the biggest things that was frustrating for fans last year in the playoff loss to the St. Louis Blues was the lack of adjustments made uh, by this team uh, throughout that series. They just kind of relied on the formula that got them there. And when it was evident that it wasn't working, there really was no fallback option for this team to go to. And so we saw throughout the preseason line tinkering. We have seen uh, some things on special teams, differences in approach and differences in personnel that at least on the power play side of things have, um, have proved dividends. And whether or not it was Dean Evison that made the move to go to Marc-Andre Fleury to start that series as opposed to Cam Talbot. Um, re regardless of if that was his call or if that call was made by uh, Bill Guerin or by even higher up than that, Dean did make the call, albeit too late, to make the switch in that series. But also, key important part is that Dean, I would imagine, did not have a whole lot of say in the decision to retain Marc-Andre Fleury to a two-year contract extension this season and also to trade Cam Talbot to Ottawa in exchange for Philip Gustafson. That's not a Dean Evison call. And so you really can only do and work with what you have on the roster. And that includes Jesper Volstead down in Iowa. But I don't know at least until the defensive deficiencies in the effort level, which we'll talk about later, until that gets fully ironed out to the point that you're confident that that is not the problem. If you bring up a, if you bring up a rookie goaltender, not to say that he can't do it, but if you bring up a rookie goaltender with the 
understanding that he is going to be relied upon to fix the goaltending situation and guide this team to a postseason run. If he is able to do that, great. If not, that's a lot of pressure that you're putting on a goalie. And I I just, at this point, you know, if he comes in and he still performs well, but the defense is bad in front of him, it's easy for those numbers to look bad. Anyway, so I don't think we see the, the Volstead move for a while, if at all, this season. And that's not to say that I agree with that. Uh, my stance has always been on on Jesper that when he looks ready, when he is knocking the door down on the AHL, in the AHL, you bring him up. And uh, so that's just kind of how I feel the coaching staff is going to handle this and how Bill Guerin's going to handle this is that he's going to resist the urge to bring uh, Volstead up as much as he possibly can. That's just, I don't think that's going to be something that factors into the plans this year. So back to Dean, these are the goalies he has for right now. And trust me, Garen sees the results. You can only, you can only coach him up so far. You can only do so much as a coach. The rest is on the players. And we saw that, I think, in the, uh, the game against the Kings the game against the Rangers to a lesser extent against the Colorado Avalanche. Dean can coach these guys up as much as he wants to, as much as he possibly can. And I guarantee you those practices are not fun at this point for this team. He can coach them up as much as he wants to, but at the end of the day, it is on the players to perform out there on the ice. And this is what, I think led to what we saw with the fourth line uh, and the lack of playing time that those guys had. Fourth line didn't play a ton against Colorado either, uh, right around, I think, seven to eight minutes of time. But this time it was Mason Shaw getting eight minutes as opposed to Marco Rossi getting four. But at the end of the day, the coach plays the lines that are working. And you're not going to, when you're down by as many goals as the Wild were in all three games. You're not going to take Kirill Kaprizov off the ice if you don't have to. You're not going to take Matt Boldy off the ice if you don't have to. And so those guys end up being the ones that play. And in a short-term situation, like that's that's what a coach does, is plays the players that give them the best chance to win. Now, the the Rossi thing we're we're going to uh, we're going to sneak another episode in here to discuss that in full uh, because I, I think there are a lot of factors that need to be looked at in that situation. But all of this to say, I don't think Evison is on the hot seat or will be on the hot seat this season unless things continue to spiral wildly out of control. But again. The GM is the one that puts the roster together. If the goalie situation turns out to be a complete failure, Dean Evison didn't make that call. That's a Bill Guerin move. Bill Guerin made both of those moves with the goalie room. Dean Evison plays the roster that he is given and tries to win as many games as possible with that roster. So I don't get the sense that Dean is going to be punished for that. We've seen some of the changes that have been made work. The team has changed the stance and the approach on the power play and has been rewarded with great results there. So that's an improvement over what we saw last year. Now, the defense wilting and the goaltending wilting is not an, is not something we anticipated to see this year. So the coaching staff is going to attempt to iron that out as much as they possibly can. And then it's on the players to uh, to return the favor and to improve uh, to perform well out there on the ice. So I don't think Dean's in danger here this season. Now, as for what this team does and looks like over the next couple of years after that, with the dead cap hits reaching their maximum, 
I still feel like Dean's going to get some leeway there because it's going to be that much harder for this team to contend during those times. So I, I don't get the sense that he's in any immediate danger, um, especially after how last season went for the most part. So I don't think he's in any need to to worry about his job security here uh, for at least the uh, the next couple of years. So hopefully that answered that question in full. Uh, we are going to talk about plenty of other things, including the center depth. We'll also talk bomb for Bedard, and we'll talk effort level overall on offense and defense as we continue to answer the fan questions on today's episode of Locked on Wild. BetOnline.net is your number one source for football info the entire season. You can find all the latest player developments, plus team matchups, news, podcasts, and in-depth articles and analysis on every single game you could possibly imagine. And as always, BetOnline.net remains your continued source for all of your sport wagering information with live betting and up-to-the-minute scores for every sport out there. The fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your favorite games and events, including Major League Baseball, MMA, Boxing, Golf, the NBA, the NHL, the NFL, you name it, it's there. So head to betonline.net or use your mobile device to learn more about all the trends and all the action. You can find all of that and more at BetOnline, where the game starts. Continuing today's episode of Locked on Wild, once again, thank you for making Locked on Wild your first listen each and every day. And uh, just as a reminder, Locked on Wild listeners, you can find our show along with the other Locked on Sports Minnesota podcasts available on Roku and Amazon Fire TV as part of Locked on Sports Minnesota. More great local sports coverage 24-7 and absolutely free of charge. So download the Locked On Sports Minnesota app today on Roku and Amazon Fire TV. Continuing to respond to user comments and questions here on today's episode of Locked On Wild and the 0-3 start for the Wilds before they take on the Vancouver Canucks, who Vancouver did it again. Got another multi-goal lead against Columbus, and they blew it. So we are going to get on Thursday, a matchup between the Minnesota Wild, who have not held a lead this season yet, and the Vancouver Canucks, who through four games literally cannot hold one. So a team that has not had a lead and a team that literally cannot hold one. Something's got to give. Something has to give in that game on Thursday. But we'll talk more about, about Vancouver for you Tomorrow, just want to continue to go through some of the comments that we've had from uh, listeners over the uh, last couple of days. Friend of the show, Wyatt Garen, asking, and I know this was in jest, but I do want to discuss it because I have seen it on more than one occasion. How would Connor Bedard look in red and green? It'd be a great consolation. It would be a long time to get there, but that would be a great consolation for this team if things go super, super bad for the entire duration of the season. But let's consider the potential candidates that are vying for the number one overall pick this season. You have, in no particular order, the San Jose Sharks, who are 0-5 so far this season, and they have been outscored 19-8. to They lost a head-to-head matchup against another hopeful for the number one overall pick, that being the Chicago Blackhawks, in which Chicago scored not one, not two, three shorthanded goals. If that is not a team trying to lose, I I don't know what to tell you. And of course, you've got the Arizona Coyotes, who somehow have beaten the Toronto Maple Leafs, and uh, they have, I believe now, two wins on the season. Uh, just the one, but it was against the Toronto Maple Leafs, go figure. So. You are going to be vying with Arizona, Chicago, and San Jose, who all coming into the season were expecting to be bad 
and are going to commit to being bad. So I don't think, even if it gets to the point where you just completely wave the white flag, I don't think this team could do enough to get themselves in position for the number one overall pick, even if they got into the lottery. So I don't think Connor Bedard is going to happen, unfortunately. And maybe I'll look back at the end of the season and be wrong. And we put ourselves in a situation to be able to get him or ended up getting him. Uh, and if that's the case, then I'll play this clip back and we'll, uh, we'll celebrate the fact that I was wrong. But at least now, I don't get the sense, I don't have the feel that this wild team is going to be anywhere near that level of futility over the course of a season. So I don't think Connor Bedard is in the cards uh, for this upcoming season. So uh, we're just going to leave it at that. Now, let's talk a little bit about Marco Rossi because what we have seen so far cannot continue. That's putting it mildly. Four minutes, 33 seconds of ice time for Rossi in his most recent game. He was scratched against the Colorado Avalanche. Didn't play. And I have to walk back a take that I had coming into the season. I was adamant that putting Rossi on the fourth line to start the year and work him in gradually was the right course of action. I see now that that is not the case. That is not the right way to approach one of your top prospects. And if you want to look at one area in which Dean Evison is not approaching this correctly, it's the handling of Rossi. It's not Marco Rossi's fault that this team has given up 20 goals through three games. And furthermore, I don't think many, if any, of the centers on this team have done anything to solidify their spots in the lineup. I would say maybe the one case you make is Jewel Eriksson Ek on the greenway Felino line, but that was a line we weren't expecting to make changes to coming into the season anyway. Now, we have made changes to it because Jordan Greenway has been hurt. But when Jordan Greenway comes back, he's getting that spot and that line is going to be set and not touched probably for the rest of the season. They've earned that equity, though, being one of the best defensive lines in the NHL. They've earned the equity to be able to get back to that level of performance. Ryan Hartman's performance to start the season has warranted him being knocked off the Kaprizov line. And he hasn't done anything to warrant being put back up there. You have put Tyson Jost on that line, and Jost, to his credit, is a battler. But if we're looking at the skill set between the two, Marco Rossi is the clear, more skilled player than Tyson Jost. That's just pure fact at this point. And so Jost battling for pucks, as opposed to Marco Rossi putting Kirill Kaprizov and Matt Zuccarello in better position to score. And Kevin Gorg said it on our postcast after the Colorado game that us seeing Rossi between Kaprizov and Zuccarello was not done just to do it during the preseason. It was a legitimate look at that combination with the intent of using it at some point during the season. I, I think at this point... You have to just work Marco Rossi into the lineup in a meaningful way or you send him back to Iowa and you give him minutes there. And I feel like sending him back to Iowa at this point after three games at the NHL level in which you really didn't give him an opportunity to show anything is a defeat. That's a loss. And so I think against Vancouver – whether it be on the Kaprizov line or whether it be on the Boldy line with um, Matt Boldy and Freddie Goudreau, I think we have to see Marco Rossi in that spot. And if he performs well, he's earned then at that point the opportunity to do it again. 
And if not, then you send him to Iowa. Send him to Iowa before the road trip. And just at that point, then they have to figure out how to get him back up here. But playing four minutes a night is not going to cut it for him. And this stems to, I think, a little bit of the old school coaching from Dean Evison that minutes are earned. But look at the rest of this roster so far. Look at the centers on this roster. Sam Steele has had nice moments. Mason Shaw played well with the fourth line guys. Okay, great. That's a fourth line opportunity. We got to set the sights higher than that. We have to get him an opportunity to play in a higher role to help out this team. So if you want to, we'll talk about this tomorrow. If you want to put something at the top of the list as for what to watch for on Thursday, just write Marco Rossi in capital letters, circle it, underline it. That's really all I am planning to watch and hope to see. And if I don't see that, I'm going to be upset. So that's, that's all there is to it. Um, we'll finish by looking at uh, one other thing. And this is a good question that has been submitted, and I think this is part of the problem of what we have seen through the first three games of the season. So we'll talk about the effort level, in particular on one side of the ice, as we finish today's episode of Locked on Wild after this. Final segment of today's episode of Locked on Wild. Thank you for making Locked on Wild your first listen each and every day. And uh, just a reminder, once again, Locked on Wild listeners, you can find our show as well as the other great Locked on Sports Minnesota programs on Roku and Amazon Fire TV as part of Locked on Sports Minnesota. More great local sports coverage 24-7 and absolutely free of charge. So make sure to download the Locked on Sports Minnesota app today on Roku and Amazon Fire TV. The final question that I wanted to get to, and again, thank you to everybody that submitted questions uh, for today's episode. I know I did throw it out there kind of on last minute notice, but like I said, we'll do this again. Um, so uh, no worries if you didn't get your question in. Hopefully we'll have some wins to talk about when we do this again, but uh, we'll try to keep it consistent with the ask L-O-W hashtag. So uh, look for that on YouTube, Twitter, everywhere to uh, to get your questions in. Uh, Eric Hansen, have you guys ever seen a team play at a more night and day level between their offensive and defensive zones? I see the energy at both ends, but the goaltending aside, our guys look like a completely different squad in our ends. Nailed it. I mean... I've, I've said it since the season started. The offense has not been the problem for this team. Offensively, they've been able to generate chances. They have been able to generate uh, sustained looks in the zone. And uh, I don't know why I didn't have this uh, thread out earlier, but I'll see if I can uh, find it as we're going. Again, uh, Dan Bradley who is one of the hosts of the Pod Snipe Selly podcast, um, had a thread in which he looked at a ton of the numbers for this team from an offensive standpoint that, uh, that give you some hope. So here we go. Let's just run through it, and then we'll get back to kind of the effort level, offense versus defense. The Wild have scored the sixth most, seventh most goals in the league. Two of the six teams ahead of them have played more games than Minnesota. Minnesota has outshot each of its opponents through the first three games. They rank sixth in the league in shots per game, which has directly led to the eighth most goals per game at four per. Uh, an increase in Corsi four percentage for the Wilds, um, up almost a percent and a half. Uh, the Wilds shooting percentage on unblocked shot attempts is actually down this season from 7.53 last year to 5.26 this year, and below last year's median, suggesting there are more goals coming. Um, so, you know, some of the offensive numbers speak to the fact that this team is doing what they need to do offensively. They are sustaining pressure. They're winning draws to keep possession alive. They're shooting and they're scoring. 
they're not doing what is necessary on the other end of the ice. And I wonder out loud if this stems from pressure because of the goaltending being as bad as it has been. At some point, you as a defenseman, do you kind of get the sense in the back of your head, like, it doesn't really matter what I do because there is a likelihood that the save is not going to be made even if I do get to the puck where I need to be and try to stop it from getting to the net? So, obviously, that if that is the case, that's not great either. But this team has just been, they've been out of position for one. They've been beaten back down the ice. Let's look at the Gustafson goal where uh, the puck kind of knuckled and he played it. It leaked underneath him and was just sitting in the crease. And before anybody could react to it, the Avalanche were able to tap it back um, into the net. So a couple of things from that play. Number one, that's one that you're expecting your goal, your goalie to save. And so an explanation for the fact that the Avalanche beat the Wild back to the net in that instance could be that the Wild guys just assumed that their goalie was going to make the save and was going to stop the puck. So why would you have to why would you have to hightail it back to defend on something that a goalie is just going to do themselves? Could be the case in that instance. I look at some of the other goals that we've seen um, earlier this season. The uh, the Adrian Kempe goal is one that just sticks in my head uh, against the Kings because in that instance, you had the entirety of the Wilds players on the ice at that point swung over to one side of the zone and Kempe just walks into the zone with the puck and has as close of a shot as he wants. Nobody even close to him. And that is an issue too. And so I don't know if it's scheme related. I don't know if it's just players not wanting to commit to what it's going to take defensively to win games. I have a hard time believing that a decor that consists of Jonas Brodine, Jared Spurgeon, Jacob Middleton, Matt Dumba, Kalen Addison, and I would make an exception for Alex Goligoski because I think he has shown some. I think he has shown some of what we saw at the end of last season. To be frank, so far this year, uh, in that his age has shown, which has hindered his performance through these first few games of the season. And so I'm confident in saying that John Merrill being back in the lineup is going to fix that spot. I haven't thought that um I haven't thought that Kalen Addison defensively. I know statistically it's not great, but I haven't thought that Kalen Addison has done anything that has stood out to me like egregiously bad on defense. I I thought he's been fine defensively. And you look at all these guys on defense for this team. I wonder if the reason that the effort level from some guys is so much better than from others is because the guys that are really bringing it are the ones that are fighting for spots post Jordan Greenway returning or at the least came into this season with the assumption that they were going to have to uh, in order to have a spot once Greenway retur- returns. Tyson Jost has been battling every single game that he's played uh, so far this season, no matter where he's been in the lineup. He's one of those guys that is fighting for a spot in the lineup once Jordan Greenway returns. Sam Steele has had good moments so far with the Wild, but he has also had not good moments. He's another one. And you just, you look at what we are seeing so far from Brian Hartman, Jordan Greenway, some of these other guys who are entrenched in this lineup. They were battling nothing coming into the season. Their spots are, were 
secure, and I'm not suggesting that Jonas Brodeen is going to get benched or anything. This We're talking a freakishly abnormal start to the season for him. But that's Jonas Brodeen, who has built up an equity of really good defensive seasons to be able to get the benefit of the doubt from this start to the season to let it cool off. Ryan Hartman, I like him as a player. A lot of people do. But his spot on that top line, we've seen it already. His spot on this top line with how he has started this season, and this was a worry coming into the year, is was he going to be able to replicate the season that he had previously? I didn't anticipate all the levels of frustration and just bad turnovers that we have seen from him so far, but I, I, I can't explain it. It is bizarre seeing a team that has looked as good as they have offensively just look lost defensively. And so I, I wonder if that's some of it is that the biggest culprits were the ones whose spots were safest on this team coming into the season. And so I don't know. It, there are so many different things that hit you about an 0-3 start to start the season. You are wanting to set the tone. You're wanting to establish what the entirety of the season is going to be like by getting off to a hot start. It alleviates a lot of pressure. And so I think a lot of what we are discussing hopefully goes away after the team finally picks up its first win. But we're not going to know until we get to that point. And so we will just continue to kind of hit on all these topics until things start to look better. The effort level was better against Colorado, so that's a step in the right direction. But as we said, after the Colorado game, a step in the right, the right direction does not lead to winning a game. You got to fully get there. And the next opportunity to do that is against Vancouver. So that will wrap it up for today's episode. Thank you to everybody that uh, sent in questions and interacted on YouTube and Twitter so far this week. We're going to get through this. It might be a little more rocky to continue at this point in the season, but higher low will continue to uh, keep plugging away uh, throughout the course of this wild season. So we thank you for uh, sticking with us at this point and make sure that you continue to do so by following along wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and hit those notifications so you don't miss out on any of our new videos throughout the week. We'll have a preview against Vancouver coming up for you tomorrow, and we may sneak in another episode between now and then, so uh, make sure to stay tuned to Locked on Wild as we keep you updated on all things Minnesota Wild with new episodes every Monday through Friday as part of the Locked on Sports Podcast Network.